Hey guys, people have been asking me for a long time to start coaching or create a course where you can find all the information and all the tools that you need all in one place in short, easily digestible chunks. And I have been listening and I'm so excited to let you know and be able to share that it's finally here. So in my new course, it's a self-paced digital course called Brain Training 101. I'm gonna help you better understand what's happening here and show you how you have more control over all of this than you probably realize and have some fun while we're doing it. So we're going to cover how everyday emotions and other factors trigger, trigger physical reactions and how understanding this and acting on this is a key component for many people to recover from conditions like ME-CFS, long COVID and so forth. So that's not what this video is about, but if you are interested in learning more about the course, there are details in the video description and I hope to see you there. And now I'm excited to welcome Jackie Baxter. She is just amazing. You're gonna love this one. She is all the way over in Inverness in the UK. Jackie's got an inspiring story to share about her journey with long COVID. So what started as just one person's health challenge turned into a beacon of hope for many when she started the Long COVID podcast. And Jackie's here to offer some real down to earth, concrete, advice and insights that can make a big difference for anyone dealing with long COVID or similar conditions. And we're also going to dive into how life after you've recovered isn't as easy and straightforward as you'd probably think. So if you're looking for inspiration, practical tips, or just wanna hear how someone turned a tough situation into something positive, you are in the right place. Hey Jackie, so excited to be talking with you today. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited to be here. And it's very strange being on the other side of the microphone today. <laughs> <laughs> I always prefer it. I find it easier for some reason, but um, ho hopefully you'll find the same. Uh, so of course, we're going to dive we'll into your whole long COVID journey and post long COVID. But, you know, a lot of people realize that this kind of all started a little bit before COVID actually started. So when you look back, what was life leading up to COVID like, and did that, do you think, contribute to, at least in some way, contributing long COVID in the end? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I, before I got sick, I would have seen myself as this, like, completely fit, very healthy, nothing wrong with me. I was 30, you know, living the dream. Everything was fantastic. I was working far too much. <laughs> I was filling every available hour. I was, you know, doing a lot of physical exercise. That was how I met my partner. We did a lot of hill walking, camping, trekking, running, cycling, basically anything that involved being active and being outside. And yeah, I was working a lot of hours. I was doing a lot of commuting. I was working freelance on top of all of that and I'm feeling exhausted just even thinking about how much I was doing so at the time I wouldn't have seen any problem with this because it was just what life had always been like I loved yeah. being busy I loved you know doing things I never said no to anything and then yeah I mean looking back on it I was like whoa you know that that was a lot. Um, I was under so much stress, you know, cognitive stress, physical stress, you know, all of these different types of stress that I now understand about. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. The story didn't start with me getting sick. The story started long before and, you know, actually going way back to patterns in my childhood as well, which has been part of the journey to kind of work out what they are and how some of them are not as healthy as maybe they should be in some ways and then you got COVID really early on you're kind of an overachiever you're like I'm gonna get this done I'm gonna be the first because <laughs> when was it that you got COVID yeah I was March 2020 uh so I actually got sick before the lockdown in the UK which was I think it was the middle of 2020 I can't actually remember now but I, yeah, I was sick a week before that so yeah I was I was doing it before it was cool um <laughs> as you say yes <laughs> And yeah, I mean, like to begin with, I didn't actually think that's what it was. Um, I don't know what it was like in the rest of the world, but in the UK, we'd been seeing, you know, things were happening in Italy, things were happening in China. In the UK, we were very much in the kind of like, things going to be fine. You know, there's no cases of COVID here. You know, there was like 15 cases documented in Scotland at the time. So when I started getting ill that week, I put it down to like a stomach bug or something, which in hindsight was ridiculous. But, you know, at the time, that's kind of what I thought it was, especially as I didn't really have the sort of symptoms that we were told to look out for 
initially. So it was presenting as more of a stomach bug. And, you know, as time went on, we kind of realized that actually a lot of people were presenting like that. And it obviously was COVID. Um, no surprises there. But yeah. Yeah, before it was cool, for sure. <laughs> not to make light of it. I just, I no, think it's not important now just to be able to um, sort of <laughs> be able to laugh a little bit at what we went through, because it is such a nightmare. Um, sure. Certainly nothing that you were laughing about at the time, but yeah. It's, <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> so what happened? So you, you got sick, um, you got COVID, and then did it seem like it was getting better? Or how did it progress from there? Yeah. So, I mean, to start with, as I said, I didn't really realize that's what it was. And then things over the next couple of days, I was like, oh, I don't feel great today. Well, I'll take the day off and I'll go into work tomorrow because I'll be fine by then. And, you know, there was a lot of pressure. No, there was I was putting a lot of pressure on myself to be back in work because there were things going on there that I needed to do. You know, kids had exams that I had to go and be there for um you know if I wasn't there things wouldn't happen and this was important um you know looking back on it actually that wasn't what was important at the time but you know again the benefit of hindsight so yeah over the first like three four days it was this kind of thing where I was like nah I still feel awful I can't go to work well I'll rest again today and I'll go in tomorrow by about the fourth or fifth day I actually thought things were getting better and then they went dramatically worse that evening to the point where my partner actually called the paramedics out because he couldn't work out whether I, you know, he couldn't work exactly out what I was dying of, but I was dying of something. Um, well, that's what he thought anyway. Um, my breathing had all gone horrendous. My heart rate was sky high. All of these things that are now relatively normal, but at the time it was utterly, utterly terrifying. And they basically showed up. They could see that I was extremely unwell, but I didn't reach the threshold of unwell that they would have needed me to be before they would have actually took me into hospital. Um, but what they did do was say, well, this is obviously COVID. Um, so it was like, oh, okay, this is horrible, but you know, you'll be fine in a few days. That was very much the narrative. That wasn't what happened. Um, over the first couple of weeks, it was just just all the symptoms, the breathing, the heart rate, the fatigue. I just felt so incredibly unwell. And then things did seem to be getting better. So what did I do? I went outside, decided to go for a walk. Um, that put me back in bed for another couple of weeks, at which point I was starting to then potter around the house, tried to go out for another walk you know, couldn't even walk to the end of the road. Like I, my breathing was so awful. So other than those couple of occasions where I attempted to go out and it didn't go well, I was sort of stuck in bed and then stuck in the house for about four to six weeks, really. But at that point, things really did seem to be getting better. Um, I got some advice that in hindsight, again, wasn't that great, you know, to kind of yeah, get yourself moving, do these things. Um, they might have said go slowly. My idea of slowly wasn't obviously as slow as it should have been. But, you know, over the next, say, two months, things were getting better. I was able to do a lot more. I was physically doing, you know, putting myself through more and more exercise, building back up. And I thought, well, this has been utterly horrendous. But at least it's over now you know the the light is at the end of the tunnel covid is going to be in the past the whole world will go back to normal and everything is going to be fine and again sadly that wasn't the case and about three and a half months in my body just eventually said nah we're done um at which point i hit a wall and you know all the sort of more traditional long covid symptoms started kicking in from there so the ups and downs where i would think oh i'm having a slightly better day well let's do all the things which would then put me back in bed and um you know and then you know over the next almost 3 years it was very much this roller coaster of old symptoms, new symptoms, fluctuating symptoms, and you know the weird ones like the toes. Like the toes were horrible, um, and they weren't like they weren't debilitating, but they were just horrendous. Um, Did you say the toes? So, yeah, so COVID toes, um, where my toes would just go kind of like black and red and sort of swollen up and sore. And this is a horrible picture, sorry. Um, and um, yeah, and I don't know if in some ways that's one of the ones that despite not being that debilitating, just kind of stick in my mind for some reason. Um, 
but yeah it was just this kind of thing where yeah you know over the best part of three years it was just you know I mean there were so many nights going to bed where I was like I'm too scared to go to sleep because I'm not sure that I'm going to wake up um and that happened over the best part of a year um and it was like you know some days some days would be kind of okay and then some days wouldn't and yeah it was it was horrible and you know I think once we recover we can kind of forget how awful that was sometimes and you know I I think that's probably healthy but at the same time it's kind of like when you put yourself back there you're like oh my goodness that really was awful like for so long and like no wonder we're all traumatized you know (laughs) it was rough yeah that's severe trauma I I can't imagine you know, with my own journey, at least I can say at no point did I think that I was you know, going to die. I just thought I was just trapped in suffering for the rest of my life. I can't imagine having just so long. Yeah. No, it wasn't <laughs> fun either. But, <laughs> but, you know, there's a spectrum of things that we go through, and that is really on the severe end. You know, how are the people around you coping? Most of the world didn't understand what was going on. So like, what was it like for your partner, your family? Yeah, it's a weird one because I think I, I didn't understand what was going on either. You know, I spent the first year trying to do all the wrong things because I had absolutely no idea what was going on. And, you know, my partner, you know, we, we'd been together for what, less than a year by the, when I got sick. Um, So I think it says quite a lot about him that he's still here. <laughs> but, you know, he... He was incredibly supportive. You know, I could never say that he wasn't supportive because he wasn't. He was wonderful. I think it was certainly that I didn't want to be supported. You know, I think I'm fiercely independent and very stubborn and, you know, never says no no to anything and always wants to do things myself. And it took me quite a long time to realise that actually what I needed to be doing was to allow him to do everything. Um, Or certainly when I was having really bad times was to just let him do everything. And he was very willing to do that. And he was wonderful. Um, He didn't understand what I was going through, you know, because how can someone understand? And I think I found this quite frustrating to start with. And maybe even more, actually, as time went on, it was like, how, how can you not get it? Because you've been here with me every single day. And then it's more as time has gone on more and more and then looking back on it and I'm thinking, you know what, how how could you have understood that on the level that I did? Because you may have been witnessing it, but you weren't living it. Um, so I think in, in so many ways, he was wonderful. He was also, you know, I'm my own worst enemy. And, you know, there were definitely times where I was pushing myself to do things that I shouldn't have been. And, you know, there were things that he wanted to do. So he wanted to go out for a walk. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'd like to go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. And, you know, I would be crashing so hard after this. And, you know, I think as time went on, he would go off and do things on his own. And like, I would hate that. And I would feel terrible. And I think he felt terrible as well. But it was like, well, I I can't be doing those things. You know, it's obviously not working. You know, the pushing through method, I've been trying that. And it's not going well. Um, So, you know, maybe I need to let him go and do those things. And I just need to try the resting method and see how that one goes. (laughs) We maybe will try something different. So, yeah, you know, he he was wonderful. Um, I think like a lot of people, friends, there are some friends that tried keeping in touch. But again, it's very difficult when they send you a message and say, hey, how's it going? And you're like, well... Either I say, oh, yeah, you know, it's okay, in which case there's nothing to talk about. And then they start telling me about their life and how they're up to all these things. And isn't that wonderful? And I end up feeling horrendous because I'm like, oh, you know, you're living your life and I'm not. Or I give them the real answer, which is, well, everything's awful. This is happening. This is awful. You know, I have all of these symptoms. Isn't everything terrible? And then they're like, I just wanted like, yeah, I'm okay" as an answer kind of thing. So it can be quite difficult. You know, you feel like feel like you don't have anything in common with people anymore or the you know the friends that you had before because because you don't in a lot of ways you know you can't do the things that you were doing with them before so I definitely have found that yeah I've I've lost touch with a lot of people and actually a lot of people that I were speaking to were the people who also had long COVID um and I made a lot of friends through that through the podcast um and you know it's it's been really great and I've made loads of really good friends through that 
But then the danger with that is that you slip into the kind of all you ever talk about is long COVID. And, you know, sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time, it would be nice if there was something else to talk about. But it takes over your life, doesn't it, in every single way. Um, and yeah, my parents, I think, tried to be supportive. They don't live very close. So I think they found it difficult to understand what I was going through. And the few times that they did see me, there was one time they saw me and I was having a horrendous week. And I think that was a bit of an eye opener for them because they were just like, oh, this is actually real. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that they didn't believe me, but they didn't understand because they hadn't seen it. So I think they meant very well, but I think they just felt quite helpless because they couldn't do anything and you know the ways they would go around fixing things like they they couldn't fix this so i think they found that quite difficult and then i i found it quite difficult to talk to them because i didn't want to tell them how things really were because i didn't want to upset them but then that meant that i didn't have anything to say to them so again it's it's quite difficult speaking to anybody isn't it about things like this i think yeah it's really tough and it's so hard to have to think about, I admire how you were thinking about how the people in your life and your supporters and your caregivers, you know, what they needed. Because I think when you're in this position, it feels like, like I'm drowning, like right now, yeah. like my life, like this is a, a emergency rescue operation, like everything needs to be focused on me right now. And I wouldn't encourage using the words I'm drowning on a regular basis because that's not helpful. But like, just to be real for a moment about how intense yeah. what we're going through is, but then to have to think about okay, these people in our lives, we want them there for us long term. And if we don't let them live a little bit, if we don't let them take a break mm. from this whole rescue the drowning person mission, um, it's tough. Yeah, it's really tough. Yeah. I know my mother really struggled with that. She didn't want my father or myself to do anything until she was better. She's like, it's only the kind thing to do until I can do things. Nobody should be doing things. But it went on for like 25 years. You know, So how do you how do you balance that out? Um, I think that's yeah. why it's good to have a good balance also of, you know, maybe some long COVID people or some MECFS people in your life, and then also some not, because you can go blue in the face trying to explain to those people in your life what you're going through, and they're never really going to get it, which is really frustrating because you're like, I just, I want you just to have five minutes of my life. Like, I just really want you to have a sense, but they're just never going to get it. So whereas, yeah, talking about your symptoms all the time and being sick all the time, probably not healthy either, but it is really powerful to have someone that just you can look in the eyes and they get it like yeah thank you <laughs> so you, you talked about you you're doing a lot of the wrong things or like a lot of people start down this path and start trying all these different strategies for recovery so were there some things that you tried initially that weren't helpful yeah I mean as I kind of said the the thing that I tried that was not helpful was pushing through um, mm. and it was the the only thing I'd ever known in my life and again looking back it's kind of like gosh what, what was I doing um, but at the time you know there were people saying you know it'll take you maybe three months to recover and I thought okay well I just need to kind of take it gentle for three months and my idea of gentle was not maybe what everyone else's idea of gentle was because I'd been always busy, always doing, always very, very active, you know, very high level of sort of physical exercise. So when someone said do a bit less, you know, it's like, well, do I run 5k instead of 15, you know, these kind of things. So, you know, I mean, actually, you know, running wasn't something that I was able to do. The few times I did try it, I crashed so hard that that was really obvious. So that was one that I kind of ditched pretty early on. But, you know, other things, walking and 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 I kind of thought, well, like looking back on it, why did I persist with that when it was so clearly not helping? And I think it was for two reasons, one of which was I didn't know what else to do. Um, you know, I think partly no one had come before me. I mean, I know that's a completely ridiculous thing to say, because obviously thousands had come before me with MECFS, but there weren't. I hadn't noticed there being that many links be made between the two early on, because again, I was early on in long COVID. And I think there was also an element of denial in there where I didn't want to be associated with MECFS because nobody recovers from that. That's a life sentence. Or that was certainly what I thought at the time. So I was like, oh, well, it can't be that. Therefore, I just need to keep doing what I'm doing and that's going to be OK. Um, but I think also, you know, there were times where I did things 
and I did feel okay. So I thought, well, I did that walk and I was okay afterwards. So clearly it's working some of the time. So being the stubborn person that I am, I would just keep going. But, you know, over time, it was like, this is obviously not working. Um, I did have to finally give that one up. It didn't mean that I didn't still overdo it and still try to do too much. But certainly the kind of pushing through, I started to learn that actually when my body says no, that is when I listen to it. So that was definitely the first thing that I tried and probably the biggest disaster. <laughs> um, you know, I, I tried so many other things, um, other things that didn't work. I tried I tried doing the diet thing and that did nothing for me. So I tried the low histamine, didn't seem to make any difference. And then I did the food intolerance rabbit hole. So I went down that one. Someone recommended that and they said, you know, get yourself tested for food intolerances. So I, you know, did that. You do the little finger prick test, send it off and it comes back. And I thought, well, I've never had a problem with food. So this isn't going to be a problem at all. And it came back with loads. And it was like, what? So I then had to go through three months of cutting all of these things out. So it was it no dairy and no wheat and no eggs, you know, all the things that I just ate so much of. So I cut all of these out and it made me feel terrible. It made me feel like mentally low as well because everything was so much more difficult. I couldn't eat some of the things that I enjoyed eating. Um, you know, my partner took the brunt of it, but you know, cooking was so much more difficult. And when you're low on energy, that's not what you want. Um, and it made absolutely no difference or no difference that I noticed. Um, so I was quite glad of that actually because it meant I could just go back to eating what I wanted. So I think they were probably the biggest two that didn't really do anything. Or that were, you know, counterproductive. <laughs> I think virtually everyone goes down that food rabbit hole. Um, mm. And I did multiple times and that whole let food be thy medicine thing. It just made mm. sense. You know, what what you put in your body is the building blocks of your body. It's everything. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that food isn't important. I think cleaning up your diet is always going to reap some good benefits. Sure. But these rabbit holes we go down just end up being really stressful. And For potentially sure. not addressing the root cause of what's going on. So that'd be a, definitely a common one. So eventually you did start coming across some things that were helpful for you. So how did you begin to find those things? And what did that look like? Yeah, so I've, I've got a big three. Um, and then a whole collection of little things. And the thing, the first thing I found was breathing. So as I said, a lot of my symptoms were around kind of respiratory stuff. You know, I was struggling with breathlessness initially and even much longer term, I was still struggling, you know, where there would, there would be days where I'd get out of breath walking up the stairs and then there would be days where actually I could walk and it would be kind of okay. Um, again, the fluctuation was, makes it really hard to work out what's going on. Um, so... I think a friend of a friend found an Instagram post from a guy that said, I can help your long COVID with breathing. And I was like, yeah, right. That sounds a bit woo woo. Um, like, I don't think so. But at the same time, this was like over a year in. Things hadn't been going great. You know, I'd been trying things that hadn't worked. And, you know, I was sort of starting to come to the realization that what I was doing wasn't working but I didn't have an alternative. I didn't really know what else to try. So I got in touch with this guy and I was like, give me your best shot kind of thing. So I signed up with him and I mean, like he was amazing in so many ways um, because what I realized was that my breathing was dysfunctional. So I was breathing through my mouth. I was breathing incredibly fast. I was breathing in my upper chest. Um, all of these things which were incredibly bad for you, but also were then in influencing the nervous system. So, you know, they're very sympathetic. So if I'm breathing very fast, if I'm breathing upper chest, if I'm breathing through my mouth, you know, what I'm basically doing is putting myself in perpetual fight or flight, which my body was basically in anyway. So, you know, it's this kind of disaster zone. So fixing that, but also then once my breathing had kind of been fixed, um, you know, I say fixed in quotation marks because no one 
breathes perfectly, everyone can breathe better. But I could then use the breath to influence my nervous system. So by slowing it down, by doing some of the other exercises that I now teach in my course. So things like single nostril breathing, things like many small breath holds, all of these things which put you into that parasympathetic state. And this breathing was it was amazing because I just didn't understand how you could not be breathing right. I just thought it was something that everybody did without thinking. Like, you just breathe. There's no right or wrong of breathing. You just breathe, right? Or you don't. Um, so this kind of like opened up a whole world where I suddenly realized, okay, this isn't woo-woo. Like, this is like hardcore awesome kind of stuff. You know, um, the, the power of this is just incredible. So... I carried on doing that and, you know, I've obviously massively now gone down the rabbit hole of breathing where I'm now actually working as a breathing instructor myself. So it made a huge impact on me. And it was the first thing that helped. You know, up until that point, I'd been trying all the wrong things and they hadn't been helping. And I'd had days where things were less awful. But with the breathing, it was like instant relief. You know, if I noticed that I was breathing too upper chest, it was literally like, okay, I've noticed this. Well, let's lie down. Let's do some diaphragm breathing. Um, or, you know, let's use some of these other exercises. And you would notice the difference almost straight away. And it was like, it was amazing. So that was huge. And that then led me on to yoga nidra, which was my second thing that really helped. And that was, again, such a difference. Because I think, I have always been a very busy person. I've always been running around. I've always been, you know, like the idea of rest, like rest is lazy, right? You know, this is what we know from my childhood. You know, rest is lazy. You don't rest. You know, what is it? A, a change is as good as a break. You know, all of these things that we get told as kids. Um, and the idea that, you know, that you needed you needed to rest, you know, that, that rest is fundamentally important in anybody's life, but especially when you're unwell, but also the different types of rest that we need. So physical rest, it's not easy, but it's much more obvious. You know, you walk to the post box, that's physical stuff. You know, you walk up the stairs, you brush your teeth, you know, all these different things, you know, that's physical. So in order to be physically resting, you need to be lying on the sofa. So, you know, that that's much more obvious, but the cognitive rest, like that was something I just didn't understand because I'd never done it before in my life. You know, I have this brain that, I mean, I love my brain. You know, I think as I've started to understand a lot more about this, I've realized how amazing my brain is. You know, it's so imaginative. It's so creative. It's so, it just does all of these things and it's amazing, but it also does not switch off it's always on the go it has this hamster wheel that just goes round and round and round and that is amazing in so many ways so long as i can switch it off because doing that all the time isn't healthy so the yoga nidra really allowed me to do that it was literally the only way that i found to stop my brain from braining um so just being able to lie down stick my headphones on put on a 20 minute yoga nidra and just rest properly like physically and cognitively rest and it was huge and like the studies into this are amazing like I can't remember if I've got the figures right but it's something like 20 minutes of yoga nidra is equivalent to like four hours of deep sleep or something like that you like it's, it's incredible um and so when when you start looking into this it's like okay well that that's why it's so good <laughs> like it's again it's not just woo woo it's actually like proper amazing stuff so that was the second thing but I think if I hadn't have done the breathing first I couldn't have done that because when you're hyperventilating which is what I effectively was doing you know it's very difficult to lie down and actually be resting so I think they had to happen in that order. So for people who are watching who aren't familiar with yoga nidra what is it? Yeah so Again, I am not 100% on this, but there's lots of different types of yoga. So you've got your movement yogas, you've got your like yin, which is more held poses. You've got your pranayama, which is your breathing. I think that's the right word. And you've got your yoga nidra, which is basically like they call it yogic sleep. Um, and it is literally stillness. 
So you lie down on the floor. I always preferred to lie on the floor to do it. Um, you lie on the floor, you make yourself comfortable and you literally listen to it um, and it guides you through things. So you're not just lying because I find, you know, if I lie on the floor and think, right, I'm going to switch my brain off and relax. You know, my brain is what's for dinner. What are we doing tomorrow? Oh, there's that thing. Oh, there's that other thing. I need to remember to tell my partner that. And, you know, some people do have this ability to just switch their brains off. Um, and I envy them. <laughs> but I think a lot of us don't. Um, so, yeah, the yoga nidra, you know, so, some of them take you through like um, different body parts, um, sort of guided. What's the word? Like guided sort of. It's a sort of guided meditation, really. Um, but it's just so incredibly powerful. I think. And there are tons of options for free out there. I know Spotify has yeah. playlists. I'm sure all the major platforms have playlists. So if you already subscribe to something, yeah. just type in Yoga Nidra and yeah, you should be able to find find lots of lots of really great stuff. Very yeah. cool. All right. So what was number three? Yeah, number three. So yeah, this was the cold water. And again, you know, I was saying a minute ago about things having to happen in the right order. Um, I thought, well, why didn't I start the cold water like right at the start? And you know, I couldn't have done because I was, as I said, effectively hyperventilating. If you do that and then go into water, that's pretty dangerous. Um, so again, they kind of had to happen in this order. Um, and I'm very lucky. I live in Inverness. We have Loch Ness like 10 minutes down the road. Um, so, you know, I appreciate a lot of people are not so lucky to have amazing water on their doorstep. But I do. And again, someone suggested this and I thought, sounds horrendous um and then put it off um but eventually it was about the, th the two year mark just over two years when I started doing this and the first time I went in it was end of April I think beginning of May time and you know it can still be quite cold here at that point but things are starting to warm up and I sort of I went in and you know very very slowly kind of inched my way in and you know, got up to my neck and screamed at my partner to like take the picture so I could get out of there. And you need the proof. Got out. <laughs> right. Um, and the view down Loch Ness with you in the water, like it's incredible. Like yeah. it's absolutely amazing. And um, so I got out, put my clothes on, and I was like, I feel I have more energy. Like it was amazing. And, you know, it didn't last, but I kept doing it. I thought, this there's something in this so I kept doing it over and over and to start with I was staying in for like a minute and then you know over time I was staying in a bit longer then I started to actually kind of swim around rather than just kind of float and over time the effects lasted longer and longer and I kind of describe this as being plugged into a socket because it literally is you know you you, you plug in and light up and you know and then you need a recharge um so i was swimming maybe two three times a week sort of regularly you know all the time and yeah over time those energy boosts they became more constant i kind of you know leveled up and you know it's it's something that i still do now you know now now i'm fully recovered and i'm you know living my life and everything is wonderful you know we we plan our hikes now around somewhere to swim so it's like oh well we could go there but we have to then divert to that loch because that looks really nice um but i think the other good thing about the swimming i mean you know the benefits of it are amazing i could go on literally all night about the miracle cure of cold water um but um i think what i also got from that was the kind of social element of it and you know we were saying earlier about you know it being very socially isolating to be this unwell with this sort of illness and people not understanding. And my partner and I started the cold water together. And it was, again, it was something that we could do together because he was off up the hills and I was like, you know, <laughs> I'm not, this sucks. Um, but, you know, we could do this together. We were both outdoory people. We were doing this outdoory thing and it was something that I could do. And it was something that was helping. Um, so that was really great for us. But I think what also was good was that I then, you know, he he didn't want to go in the cold water as often as I did, which, you know, is kind of fair enough, right? Um, but I then met up with a group of people locally and uh, 
they you know they were you know from all of all around um swimming for all sorts of different reasons and you know i was like oh i don't i don't want to go and join them because i might cancel last minute or they might want to go swim further than me or you know all of these things and then eventually i did i went along and you know it was just so nice to meet some people that they didn't know old me they knew you know me then so they weren't judging me on my past you know some of them were swimming because they had health stuff and you know it was basically everybody did what they wanted to do and and it was just so awesome to have some new friends to have some social interaction to have this kind of thing in common where you sort of get out the water and you're all standing there and there's you know towels and socks and clothes and where's my underwear and you know it was just hilarious um and it was just really lovely to have that and then you know over time as i got better and better and better you know to be able to do more things with them and you know we had a, a solstice barbecue last year on the beach um after a swim and it was it was just so cool. Yeah, that was the third one. <laughs> and even if people aren't able right now to go jump in a really cold bottle, body of water, because you said there are so many health benefits that come from it. Yeah. And one of them I learned about recently is even just splashing cold water on your face shuts down your sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight yeah. system. And when you think about it, like every movie, every TV show you ever watch, when someone has something incredibly stressful happen to them, they go to the bathroom and they splash cold water on their face. Yeah. And it's not that they just suddenly feel the urge to have a clean face. It's, you know, it's doing something for our body. So yeah. even if you can't do ice baths or jump into some freezing cold lake, there are, you know, even just small things or 30 seconds or 60 seconds in your shower of switching it to cold. I, I have it stack it with washing my hair. So I always rinse out my hair with cold water mm. and then stay in and do a few turns in the shower. And it all adds up. It's, you know, it helps us. It's, it's just, you can just do a, people watching a quick Google and you see there's a lot of studied benefits that come from it, from helping sleep, helping stress, you know, helping longevity. Just, I, oh yeah, lots, lots of good stuff. Yeah. And it was a part of my CFS recovery as well. Um, I, I did regularly um, cold stuff and I found it really helpful and I did always feel better after. So I know you talk about, you know, mental health and its relationship with chronic illness. So you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is, this has been huge. This, this is something that we don't talk about enough because I think a lot of people, certainly a lot of people with long COVID, and I suspect this goes back beyond, you know, further back than long COVID into MECFS and, um, you know, where people are worried about talking about mental health because, you know, they'll, you know, the doctor will be like, ah, I told you it was just anxiety. I told you it was just depression. You know, I've been saying this all the time. And, you know, not all doctors are like that, um, but a lot are, unfortunately. And, you know, I think the fact of the matter was I was incredibly depressed because my life as I knew it was over. Um, you know, I was living this, you know, kind of half life and, you know, everything was terrible. And, you know, yes, I was extremely anxious because I didn't know what life was going to be like. And I was worried that this was what things were going to be like forever. And, you know, I think we talked about trauma earlier, you know, <laughs> severely traumatized um, about, you know, yeah. partly the length of the illness and, you know, living every day, I think, with chronic illness is traumatizing. Um, but, you know, my initial infection was, you know, <laughs> there were definitely elements of that as well. And I think it was kind of understanding that actually this was what was going on with me as well, on top of all the physical stuff that was horrendous, that, yeah, there was a lot of mental health things going on with me. And it was almost like, as I started to see physical improvement, it was almost like the mental side of it became so much more obvious. And, you know, again, as I started to see improvement, you know, I realized that the anxiety over everything, and it was almost like, as I got more better, I got more anxious because it was like, oh, well, you know, I'm doing better. Maybe the light is at the end of the tunnel, but also I was too anxious to actually acknowledge that maybe the that that um the light was at the end of the tunnel because every time I'd thought that before, boom, you know, I'd gone back into a relapse. So it was like the anxiety was ramping up and up and up, and then the thought of well, you know, reinfection, you know, that's going to send me back to square one again. So you know, people, people are bad. I can't go places. I can't do all of these things. And yeah, it just got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And I think, you know, this is one of my soapboxes, you know, I think talking about mental health within chronic illness or talking about mental health anyway is important, right? But talking about mental health with chronic illness is just so important. And, you know, 
there was someone that I interviewed that said something like an untreated mental health condition is as bad as an untreated physical health condition. And I think he was right. And, you know, we know that the two are linked. So if we're very physically unwell, then that is going to impact our mental health. But at the same time, if we leave our mental health unchecked, then that is going to have a knock on effect into our physical health. So, you know, it's important to see both sides of it. And, you know, I one of the best decisions that I made was starting to see a therapist and it took me about it was about 18 months in before I started doing that and you know I thought oh I don't need to do this because you know I have my partner to talk to and like <laughs> like that wasn't fair on him and I realized that um but speaking to her was just so helpful because you know she wasn't able to help the physical stuff but she was able to help me navigate some of the other stuff and it was just yeah you know she was she was so helpful so I think just yeah you know mental health is so important and you know when you're feeling terrible about everything then you know that maybe is something that you can do and I think what you can do is so important because we know all too well what we can't so yeah, and we yeah so well done. With, with, <laughs> with our understanding of the autonomic nervous system and that whole fight or flight right. system that is impacting many people that by not addressing your mental health, you can spiral into a bed bound state because you become terrified yeah. of the symptoms, terrified of going outside, just so fearful of your future, so full of anxiety, which reinforces to your body, something is really wrong. And then they give you more symptoms and more symptoms. So, but I think, yeah, and there's also a hierarchy of illnesses, you know, and we have put mental health illnesses way at the bottom, not important, something that you should be able to probably just control on your own. You know, it's not a real thing. And when you're already dealing with something maybe called chronic fatigue syndrome, which is already really low on that hierarchy that we've created of what we think is valid. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a really important topic to discuss. Yeah. And I think that leads into, because I used to worry about if and when I recover, how will I go on living my life? How can I put this trauma behind me? How can I pretend it didn't happen? How can I just reintegrate into normal life and pretend I haven't just been in this thing. So, you know, you and I have talked before about how recovering isn't that happily ever after that we think it's going to be. So what was your experience of once you did recover? What did that look like? Yeah, it was really, really weird. And I always feel a bit strange t saying that because, you know, it makes it sound like I didn't get what I wanted. Like, you know, recovery was absolutely what I wanted and it was amazing and I am like beyond grateful that I have my life back and that I'm fine and all of these things but at the same time coming out of that and you know I was sick for what three three years three months I think it took me and you know not to minimize anyone's experience if they had a shorter illness but I think maybe the longer you're ill for the harder it is to come out the other side and you know obviously yourself your experience was much longer than mine um so I don't know I'm kind of spitballing here um but yeah coming out of that you know and that three years the world changed in those three years as well mm -hmm. so when I got sick you know everything was quote unquote normal and then the pandemic kind of happened and then when I'd recovered you know it was almost like the pandemic had ended. I mean, it obviously hasn't, there's, you know, <laughs> it's still ongoing, but you know, it was, it was a different world that I was coming out into, but also that I was a very different person. And I think part of my recovery was realizing that, you know, I wanted to be able to do all of the things that I did before, but I also wanted to be a healthier person. And I am, I'm a much healthier person now, you know, I'm much less stressed. I'm much more aware of my body. I listen to my body now, you know, when it tells me to stop, I'm like, huh, I've had quite a busy week. Yeah, let's do, let's have a more restful weekend. You know, let's not go climb 20 hills. Let's, you know, go for a swim. Um, so it's, yeah, coming out of it, it's yeah it's been a very strange kind of transition period and I think yeah to start with as you said I was kind of terrified of it was like I'm recovered everything's fine I could literally do anything and that was kind of terrifying in itself um you know it was this kind of it's about choice isn't it you know you need to have enough choice to feel safe but if you have too much choice then you feel overwhelmed and unsafe and I think I was kind of teetering between the two um so it was kind of like yeah I was terrified of 
doing too much and putting myself back into illness but also you know I was like well I'm well now so I can push those boundaries I can do those things I can get fit again you know all of these things and it was realizing that I had to think of myself as an unfit healthy person and I didn't really know how to do that because I'd never been that before um you know I'd always been a fit person um so it was having to really build these things up from the ground and really just kind of explore what life was going to be now am I going back to doing the same thing I was doing before work-wise or was I gonna head off on my own and do something different and I had so many options and so many possibilities and you know I was very lucky to have a career break so my sick pay ran out and you know I went on to a career break which gave me a, a year so I was able to sort of try things and you know see see what happened and experiment and go and get my breathing certification and then try teaching some breathing and see what actually happened and is this what's going to make me happier um and to give myself that kind of flexibility in life but while also allowing myself to just have the time to work out what you know who I am now you know I'm Jackie 2.0 you know I've I've had an upgrade you know it wasn't an, it was a pretty uncomfortable upgrade um but you know I I genuinely think that I am a healthier and happier person now um but you know that's not, not to say that I wanted to go through the last three years it was horrendous but you know I think you know I've I've always been the sort of person that wants to look at things in a positive way so you know yes that was awful and I'm not trying to minimize that at all because you know I, I don't think we should minimize our horrendous experiences you know all of our trauma and you know that that is going to live with me but at the same time what can I take from that um you know what have I learned things about boundaries for example um you know and all these kind of tools that I've learned that I can now take forward into my new life so you know the breathing and all of these things and the podcasting you know all these skills that I've learned that I now realize that actually I really love doing so how can we take that forward how can we make what was awful into a kind of yeah new positive direction I guess if that doesn't sound too cheesy <laughs> yeah absolutely and I think coming out of it knowing that we are still imperfect and also that we are resilient it's taken me a long yeah. time to not be afraid of any sort of symptoms coming up like is it back is it back what's happening and then also like oh if I have a really stressful week or I push myself too hard and I get run down I'm like this is what causes CFS it's gonna come back but in yes, chronic stress and chronic overdoing it is not good, but we're built to handle stress and we're built to occasionally push ourselves too hard. So it's okay. We're going to be imperfect. Our bodies are going to be imperfect. We're going to have little things and just kind of just re finding peace with all of that, I think is really important. Yeah. And realizing, yeah, like you say, you know, I mean, one of my unhealthy patterns was perfectionism and, you know, yeah. If you'd asked me if I was a perfectionist four years ago, then I would have been like, yeah, maybe a little bit. And now I'm just like, yeah. Um, yeah. And also kind of understanding how how that can be a really great thing in some ways. You know, it, it's what makes me a good musician. But at the same time, if you then apply perfectionism to recovery and to health and all these things, like that's completely unhealthy. Um, you know, and nobody's perfect. You know, everybody has stuff. Everyone has a week that's too stressful and then feels run down over the weekend. And that's just normal. But as you say, you know, you now have that resilience that allows you to go, okay, well, I pushed myself pretty hard last week, but instead of put me in bed for two months, actually my body's saying, Are you sure about this? And I'm able to go that was quite a hardcore week. Maybe we need to say no to a few more things. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm kind of learning from that, you know. Yeah, and just trusting that you can handle it and then, then it will be yeah. okay. Yeah, I think so. So you have an amazing podcast. You are doing um, lots of things to support others who are now going through these really tough journeys. So tell us about that. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So yeah, the podcast was something that I set up a bit over two years ago. And it was it was kind of out of desperation to start with it was like I feel so alone I don't know what's going on ah, uh, maybe there's other people that are feeling the same so it started off being you know I interviewed a few people and thought maybe I can share some lived experience stories and it soon turned into this kind of thing where I'm like oh 
I'm interviewing this medical expert from Florida. Oh, I just spoke to someone in Australia who has this, you know, amazing thing. And, you know, people like yourself. Um, and it's it's kind of grown arms and legs. And I think it's it's become something that I've just really, really enjoyed doing and, you know, connecting with all these incredible people who I would never have met otherwise. So again, I suppose it's taking something positive from uh, from the horrendousness, isn't it? Um, but I think what was important for me was always, what can we do? So we know very much what we can't, um, but what can we do? You know, what can we do to help? Let's get a breathing expert on because that was big for me. Let's get someone to talk on about diet and, you know, just all these people who were contributing their little bits and pieces to the puzzle and not everything is going to work for everybody but you know i learned something from every guest i interviewed um even even if it was just a teeny tiny thing um and you know just really bringing this all together into this resource that is there for people because you know one of the first things for me was I have no idea what was going on. I'm literally flailing. I'm trying all the wrong things. So let's make this information accessible. Let's put it out there. You know, let's put out some recovery stories as well because they're important and just bring this all together in this kind of like easy to access sort of medium that people can listen to as and when they want to. You know, if the episode is too long, you can pause it. Um, you know, it's not like a a Zoom that you have to be present for kind of thing. Um, so I just, yeah, started out of desperation and, you know, it's it's grown into something that I didn't expect it to. <laughs> um, but it's been hugely rewarding for me. And, you know, my I really don't have that much of an ego, but that doesn't mean that it's not nice when people get back in touch with me and say, this episode changed my life. You know, that that was always makes me think, oh, it gives you that warm inside feeling. Um, that's amazing. Um, so that was great. And then through the podcast, I connected with Vicky. And Vicky is a breathing instructor. Um, and we sort of started talking about breathing. And I thought, oh, gosh, this is exciting because breathing really helped me as well. Um, and we kept in touch. And we are now working together um, to help people with long COVID with breathing. So partly with allowing people to breathe more functionally and then also with the sort of exercises to influence the nervous system and bringing this all together in a really accessible way for people with long COVID. Because again, what both of us have noticed is that working with someone who has that knowledge of the condition is important. You know, so working with someone who doesn't understand the nervous system and how dysregulated the nervous system can be in long COVID, you know, is probably going to pitch exercises too hard and start doing breath holds and things, which is just way too much. So we're really going for the kind of we we get you and we're you know gonna teach you these exercises that are safe for you but also how to make them safer for you each day as well you know so getting people to learn their own bodies and and all of this so yeah it's been incredibly rewarding and you know I think I just I I know you know, no one can understand anyone else's experience 100% because everyone's experience of even the same illness is different. But I know what it's like to be so unwell and to be feeling terrible and to sort of lose all hope and to just not know what to do. And I think, yeah, it's really important to me to be offering something that is practically useful, that will help people, that will bring them together, bring them into that kind of social space as well, supportive sort of small group environment um, with something that, yeah, will really practically, usefully help them um, with their recovery and, you know, with their life beyond recovery as well, I think. So incredible. I think that's absolutely amazing. I love the ripple effect that's happening in the world. I think of us like all these little, you know, soldiers is the right word, but, you know, recover and then we help. Like there's yeah. hundred, there, like literally hundreds of millions of people now that have long COVID and MECFS. So there's just such a need for this kind of stuff. And of course, I'll have yeah. all of your stuff listed in the video description for your podcast, Thank your you. coaching, all the ways to get in touch. Um, for those of you watching with Jackie are there. So I really encourage you to take take a look at that. And I just want to send a quick shout out before we wrap up here to um, channel member Jim Robertson. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining the channel. I really appreciate the support. Sending big, big hugs to you and massive hugs to you, Jackie. This has been absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for doing this today. 
Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, oh, this is really wonderful. I know people are going to appreciate it. Uh, for those of you watching, I know it's a lot of information to take in. So if you haven't already signed up for my newsletter, I send one out every week and it's just got bullet point takeaways, the key things from the interviews in case you don't happen to catch them all. So there's a link in the video description uh, if you'd like to sign up for that as well. So yeah, thank you again, Jackie. Thank you to all of you watching. Looking forward to your comments. Love hearing what you have to say. I hope you enjoyed this video and this interview as much as I did. I hope you got something out of it and I hope to see you uh, in one of these next ones that I'll put up for you here that I think you might like.